In this video, we're going to take a look at safety and first aid in a chemical laboratory. So first we're going to take a look at general precautions that need to be made in the chemical laboratory. So the first thing you do is your pre-lab work. Be prepared to work when you arrive, get into the laboratory on time, and familiarize yourself with the lab procedures before beginning the lab. Carefully follow all written and oral instructions, performing only those activities that are assigned by the teacher. Never do anything in the laboratory that's not called for in the lab procedure or by your teacher. Again, following all directions, doing only as you're supposed to do. Notifying the teacher, myself, if you have any medical problems that might be affected by the lab work, such as allergies or asthma that might be affected as fumes are being produced in a particular lab. Don't do any work in a laboratory without supervision. Should the teacher not be in the room or have to walk into the other room for a quick second to grab something out of the prep room, you shouldn't be doing any work when you're in the lab without proper supervision. A big no-no is not eating or drinking anything when you're in the laboratory. You don't want any food that could be contaminated being consumed. And bringing back only what you need when you're in the lab. You don't need bags and books and other things cluttering your lab space that you might be bumping into your lab materials with. And lastly, clothing. Make sure your clothing is not loose and dangling and going to affect anything within your work area. Either roll up your sleeves, remove any loose garments and jewelry as need be. That way you don't accidentally knock over anything that you shouldn't. You want to make sure that if you have any loose hair, long hair, that you tie it back. That way it doesn't fall into a beaker of chemicals or into the open flame. Also, you want to have proper footwear because if you were to spill those chemicals and they would fall off the desk, they'd land right on top of your feet. So you don't want to be wearing sandals or some sort of open-toed shoes. Having goggles on and an apron will also help protect you from chemicals that might be spilled or splashed into your face. Avoiding contact lenses also because fumes that could be released will get absorbed by your contact lenses and have them pressed up against your eyes. No, you don't want to horseplay in the lab because fooling around only creates more chaos in a small amount of space, more likely for accidents to happen. Usually it's the people who aren't fooling around to be the ones that get hurt. Make sure you set up your apparatus properly along with using the right instrumentation to one, set up your apparatus or two, to be picking up chemicals. If you're trying to pick up a beaker, don't try and pick up a beaker with test tube holders. And also don't try and use like crucible tongs to pick up a beaker because those aren't going to work either. Use the beaker tongs. And keep all combustible materials away from flames, because if you have open flames and combustibles anywhere near them, then they could catch on fire, especially if the liquid that's evaporating and those fumes could catch on fire. If you plan taking a smell of any chemicals, make sure you use proper technique. Wafting for those odors is the way in which you'd like to do that. You don't want to put your nose right over it and take a big whiff. You want to waft a little bit of those vapors towards you. And if those vapors were to happen to be poisonous and something you knew from the get-go, you'd want to make sure you do it in the fume hood right away so that way you're not going to accidentally breathe in something you shouldn't. And when you're done with your experiments, make sure you dispose of all chemicals properly. Not everything can be washed down the drain or just put into, into the waste basket. You have to either make sure they've been properly extinguished or uh, sometimes collected and then neutralized before they can go down the drain. At which point then you can clean up your workstation, wipe it all down and make sure you left it the way you found it. Also within doing the experiment you want to make sure you know where all the emergency equipment is whether it be the fire extinguisher, fire shower, fire blanket, first aid kit, or eyewash. If any accidents were to happen as long as you know where everything is it takes a little bit of that panic when the emergency first happens. And lastly, if a spill or an injury were to happen, notify me, notify the teacher, because we'll make sure that things get taken care of properly. I know you might think that the teacher might be mad if you spilled something, but they'll be more mad if you spill something and didn't tell them, and then somebody else got hurt because of the mess you left behind and it wasn't cleaned up properly. Next, we're going to take a look at proper handling of chemicals. First of all, you want to make sure that when you're using a chemical, it is the chemical that you want to be using. Read and double check the labels especially if in your procedure it has the name of a chemical and then on the bottle it has a formula. If worse comes to worse, ask, double check, make sure that it is what you are actually supposed to be using. You don't want to mix chemicals together that shouldn't be mixed. And along with that, make sure we don't contaminate those chemicals. The stock chemicals that come out of those bottles 
make sure you're using the proper spatula or the proper dropper that goes with that particular chemical. Don't take one from a different chemical and mix it together because now you're going to contaminate the chemicals, making them not pure anymore, along with, again, possibly mixing things that shouldn't be mixed together. If you're going to be transferring those stock chemicals to another container for you to use, make sure you're pouring it away from your body. You don't need to be like Frankenstein and hold it really far out, but you don't want to be holding it close to your body either because it might well, it splash or spill on you and you don't want that to happen. And in order to do that, it might be best to do it with gloves. That way it doesn't touch your hands. You don't want to just pick up chemicals in your hands nor do you want to actually have it spill on you. So latex gloves might be a good way to protect yourself from getting chemicals on you. And if you're mixing acid and water together, make sure you mix the acid into the water. Don't add water to acid. You want to add acid to water because it is usually a very exothermic process. And if you add water to the acid and it heats up, you're going to vaporize that acid. Also, if you're pouring it in, the one that's being poured in is going to be the one that is going to displace the other liquid. And if you're pouring the water into the acid, also it's going to splash the acid onto you. Whereas opposed to if you're pouring the acid into the water, it's going to be the water that's going to be displaced. Again, as we see here, pouring the acid into the water, not water into acid. So most of the times we're going to be using glassware with our chemicals because glass doesn't absorb chemicals as well as plastic does. So we're going to use glass. And if you have a glass tube or a glass rod in which you are carrying, you want to carry it vertically in front of you because you're much more aware of what's going on in front of you than off to your sides. If that glass rod needs to be placed into a stopper, because oftentimes when I do a reaction like in a Merlemeyer flask and you want to collect the gas coming off, then that glass tube or glass rod that needs to be inserted into that stopper, you should make sure you're wearing gloves, have it slightly lubricated so it slides more easily through that stopper, and do so in a gentle twisting motion. Again, as you see here, wearing those orange gloves, twisting that glass tube into the stopper to insert it completely. If you're taking a piece of glassware and heating it up, be mindful of the fact that after you heat it up, it doesn't like to go directly onto the desktop right after because the desktop is going to be much cooler and when glass cools down really quickly it tends to break. So make sure you put it on an insulating pad, let it cool down before you put it onto any cool surface. And make sure that you give it ample time to cool down because it's really difficult to know if a piece of glass is hot or not until you actually touch it and get burned. So hot glass and cool glass looks exactly the same so give it plenty of time to cool down. Oftentimes they're not in a rush. Also, you don't want to take hot glass and put it directly in the water either. That doesn't work out well. Actually, even worse than putting it right on the desktop. And lastly, should you happen to break a piece of glass, don't pick it up with your hands. Use a dustpan and brush, or especially tell me. I'll take care of it. Make sure it all gets picked up. Again, just like if you spill a chemical, let me know so it gets cleaned up properly. Same thing happens when you break glass. Worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to not tell me not tell the teacher, it doesn't get cleaned up properly, somebody else gets hurt later on, and then there's chemicals on that glass, and somebody now is injured and has a burn from a chemical because you didn't tell the teacher that this break happened and somebody else got hurt unknowingly. Building off of the heating of substances, when you're using Bunsen burners, make sure that your clothing and your hair are away from the flame. Again, in other combustible materials. You don't want anything near the flame that could catch fire, especially if it's something that you are wearing. And once you've done your heating that you're using the Bunsen burner for or a hot plate, turn it off. Even if you need it three steps later, you might accidentally put something through the flame that you shouldn't or you know, spill something into it. So make sure that when it's not in use, it's off. It takes two seconds to turn back on or relight back up so there's no need to keep a hot plate or a Bunsen burner going if you're not going to be using it. And don't try and burn things or heat things that shouldn't be. I know it looks really cool to put a pencil into a Bunsen burner, but you shouldn't be burning pencils. That is not anywhere in the instructions. It is nowhere in your procedure, so don't do it. And if you're going to heat a test tube, make sure it's not pointed towards yourself or anybody else. You don't want it to be bubbling over and into your face or releasing odors that shouldn't be released into somebody else. Also, make sure it's not closed. If you have a stopper in it, you're going to create a projectile to go flying off, or worse, if the stopper's in there really tightly, it's going to explode. So make sure that it's an open container and not pointed towards anybody. 
Also, inevitably, even if you're being careful, accidents are going to happen, injuries might happen, but hopefully those injuries are just minor. If you like a minor cut and you're bleeding from that minor cut, then all you need to do is get a cloth that's absorbent, apply some pressure with that cloth, and allow the blood to clot and close up that little cut. Should it happen to be a larger cut, then you want to make sure you raise that body part up above your heart level. That way it's pumping uphill and it won't bleed as much and it'll slow down the bleeding, allowing it to clot. And should it be really bad, we'll have to take you to the nurse. The nurse will get you cleaned up and take care of it. And again, if any time any accidents happen and there's any type of injury, it's always a good idea to just get the nurse involved because she'll make sure everything is taken care of. Again, she's the professional. She knows what to do. Let her handle it. Should you happen to spill chemicals on your skin or even worse, in your mouth, here's what you have to do. If you get on your skin, you want to make sure you just flush with water for a good 15 minutes. After that, we'll take you down to the nurse. She'll check it out. Again, make sure you don't have any chemical burns happening. Or if it needs to be neutralized, maybe if you get an acid, we'd like to neutralize it like with baking soda. That way, it doesn't keep burning and burning and burning. But flushing with water should prevent that from getting any worse. If you happen to get it in your mouth, make sure you don't swallow it. You spit it out. You don't want to ingest any chemicals bad enough to get it in your mouth. Spit it out as best you can, even to kind of wash your mouth out, mouth out a little bit, rinse like you do at the dentist's office. Should you happen to swallow it, we got to make sure we notify the nurse immediately and she'll get in contact with poison control and make sure that everything is taken care of. And in this case, you don't want to drink anything. You don't want to make it any worse. You don't want to wash it down any farther. If you ever get chemicals in your mouth, do not drink water to try and dilute it down. Again, we'll get the nurse involved and she'll make sure the proper steps are taken care of. Next, if you happen to get in your eyes, which isn't going to happen anyway because you're wearing goggles, but you know, the occasional time could happen where you've taken the goggles away from your face because they're a little fogged up, or because you put your goggles away and you're walking back to your desk and somebody else's group happens to splash in the eye, then we got to make sure we take you over the eye wash. And again, just like on your skin, flush your eyes for at least 15 minutes in the eye wash. And again, we're going to notify the nurse and she's going to come on down and make sure you're taken care of and see if we need to get anybody else involved, maybe trip to the emergency room just to make sure that your eyes are good. If your hair or clothing were to catch on fire, then you make sure you stay still. You don't want to run around frantically in circles because as you run around, you're bringing more oxygen to the fire and the burning is going to happen even faster. So stay still and we'll make sure somebody else gets involved to make sure that fire gets put out. It should happen to be like your clothing... You yourself could stop, drop, and roll, or somebody could come and help smother you, like with a fire blanket or a jacket or anything else that happens to you lying around, or even themselves if they're really that brave. But with your hair, then we would again make sure we get the fire blanket involved to make sure that fire is completely smothered out on top of your head. Remove it from the cabinet. Again, just make sure it's draped over the area that is on fire, because without oxygen, fire can't burn. Should you happen to breathe in smoke or other chemical Fumes, again, this shouldn't be an issue because anything that would be of that kind of danger we're going to do in the fume hood. But sometimes, you know, things get, start reacting as you pour them into a maybe completely not washed Erlenmeyer flask. And all of a sudden you're taking chemical fumes you weren't planning on breathing in as you're walking over to the fume hood to do such an experiment. So should this be the case, make sure that not just you, but everybody leaves the lab because if you're able to breathe in toxic fumes, that means those toxic fumes are in the room, or if it gets so smoky that it's bothering you, then it's gonna to be too smoky to bother everybody. And if it happens to be smoke, you wanna make sure you get down low and crawl beneath the smoke, because again, smoke's going to rise. And then at which point we'll close the door, keep all those toxic fumes or smoke inside the room, allow it to get properly ventilated again before anybody else is able to return. Again, it might be something small where I'd be able to determine when people are able to go back in, or if it was a really bad fire, the fire department would come and tell us when we're able to go back in. And then lastly, sometimes people, when they get a really bad injury, go into what's called a state of shock. So a person with a really bad injury can go into the state of shock, and one way to notice that is they begin sweating with really cold, moist skin, or they have a really weak, rapid pulse. And the best thing to do for somebody to stay in shock, again, is leave them where they are, don't let them walk anywhere, and again, we'll call the nurse and she'll come and take care of them. Just lay them out on the floor, 
and keep them comfortable and make sure that if they have any tightly fitting clothing on that you loosen up so they can breathe properly and get enough oxygen to calm down.